Welcome back to the Mom Mentality Show. My name is Austin Chadwick and my co-host is Chris Lucian. And we're very excited to have Steve Tendon uh, with us today, coming all the way from Malta for uh, this uh, recording, which is really, really fun. Um, and we got lots of uh, great topics to go through today. Uh, the economies of swarming and mobbing, uh, the pattern of conceptual integrity, uh, the pattern of unity of purpose, and also tame flow, of course, because we have Steve on the show. Uh, so uh, to get us started, Steve, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, uh, hello, everybody in the audience, and um, thank you for inviting me to uh, this uh, interview. Uh, I've been looking at, uh, at your uh, broadcasts on, on and off, and uh, there's not been one that was not interesting. So uh, you've set the bar pretty high for me. Um, so uh, who am I? Well, uh, I am a former software engineer turned management consultant and also as of lately uh, let's say an expert on blockchain technologies and uh, things related to um, to that field um, in my career I have been uh, coding for uh, over 20 years and uh, um, then uh, uh, went over into more management things but in particular I was uh, involved in uh, merger and acquisition operations of software companies. So I got the wonderful assignment of assessing how good a software organization was uh, as a target acquisition. And that's when I started looking into, well, now what is a good software development company? What's, uh, what are the ingredients? What should I be looking for? What are the warning signs? And uh, in doing this, uh, I, uh, I also uh, like perfected my, my own approach. Eventually, it became known as the TameFlow approach. But you know what? It was the best kept secret of the industry because for me, it was only my own uh, um, secret sauce that I used as a solo uh, consultant. Um, two years ago, I came across a rather... Daniel Duaron came across me um, and uh, he was so curious to know more about TameFlow. He started emailing me and question after question, uh, eventually we got to a point where we said, no, we should really write a book about this. It's actually my second book on TameFlow and, uh, and uh, uh, the first one was published in 2012, 13. Um, but uh, this one was quite different because Daniel pushed me to the limits with all his questions. And I think that made the book into something really good. But I, I let you maybe uh, be a judge of that. But long story short, once this book was written, Daniel was not happy. And he pushed me to, uh, quote, quote, commercialize TameFlow. So since February, I am into this new venture of, turning TameFlow from my, my own best kept secret into an approach that, uh, well, you could uh, imagine it's something that is competing to Scrum, Kanban, and all of those. So that's it. And here I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, Fantastic. welcome to the show. Um, so uh, one of the topics uh, that um, I, I think that we had talked about before and sound interesting to me um so you have this uh concept of um economies of swarming and mobbing and so uh you know what, what does that look like and and maybe what, is, what how does that relate to to that uh you know yeah right so uh since i've been uh working with lots of executives and uh uh for executives, the the primary um, element of uh, of uh, reference uh, is an economic one. Uh, anything that happens in a software development organization has to be translated into economic terms. And uh, a lot of what I do uh, in uh, in my research and practice um, looks at metrics that that um, reflect like the the uh, uh, performance of the software developing organization or unit or team 
and uh, there uh, the uh, the notion of uh, of throughput i notice i don't use velocity velocity is a notion i do not use story points uh, well we can we can have nice debates about story points but the the short of it is that managers cannot relate to uh, to story points so we need to use some other kind of numbers which are much more significant and throughput is more significant why because it can be uh, translated into more direct uh, financial elements now to get there i often talk about uh, flow efficiency and uh, of course managers are maybe uh, conversant in uh, in lean terminology um, Lean is taught in uh, in management schools, while uh, agile and uh, and software engineering obviously are not. So, referring to uh, like the Toyota production system and uh, and um, the uh, elements that make a production line uh, efficient are interesting um, uh, reference points. Now, of course, we know software is not manufacturing, so there are some gaps that need to be. To be filled some uh, some dots that need to be uh, connected but once you start seeing that even in a software engineering organization you can start measuring like flow efficiency you can start measure cues you can start measuring wait times and active states um, you get to flow efficiency you can show that <clears throat> if you address the flow efficiency issue now i don't mean that we should actually measure flow efficiency but if we can address the flow efficiency so that uh, work stays less in a waiting state so that people do not multitask well the returns can be can be staggering now on top of this like my speciality my claim to fame if you wish is that i have been looking a lot on the theory of constraints. So um, how to manage quote, quote, bottlenecks, even though that is a very um, limiting interpretation of what the theory of constraint is about. So once you start to help uh, <clears throat> executives to appreciate the, um, the value of uh, flow efficiency, the next step is to make them appreciate um, throughput efficiency. And, and that's where you can get uh, enormous gains, uh, measurements uh, I have, as, you know, if you act on on flow efficiency, maybe you get uh, you know, 20%, plus 20% of, uh, of uh, performance, but if you are able to address the constraint and uh, work with throughput, you can also have staggering figures like plus 300%, and, uh, and that is almost unheard of. Well, maybe not unheard of, but very, very uncommon. Um, so how does, uh, does um, uh, the, the various um, techniques, so to say, of working together from pairing to, to mobbing actually uh, help this? The, the easiest way to understand the effect of mobbing with reference, for instance, to lean, is that it realizes the ideal state of one piece flow. So basically one piece of work that does not sit still, but that is always in motion towards its uh, destination. And, and uh, even if you have, and this is the, the, uh, the obvious um, um, objection that managers come up with, you know, even if you have people uh, that apparently are just sitting there fiddling their thumbs because they are just looking and maybe just uh, commenting every once in a while. Um, even so, the economic impact is much in favor of that kind of situation uh, rather than um, a line of workers with, uh, with lots of handovers and queues in between and, and hidden multitasking, which is never actually uh, noticed. In, uh, in high performing organizations it's not uncommon to have um, people who are how can we say idle uh, people who are waiting for work while in mm, inefficient organizations we have the cues we have work waiting for people 
and uh, and mobbing is one technique to um, optimize the one uh, one piece flow. So when I try to explain uh, or justify why mobbing is viable or pair programming, I often refer to these uh, to these arguments. And you know what? I also have always the the uh, the the backup argument that well, if you don't believe it, at least you know, give the benefit of doubt, run an experiment, start measuring, run it for a month or two, and then you will decide on the basis of numbers, which are always more convincing than consultants that are painting rosy pictures in the future. I think uh, I, I I've lived through that, right? Like I, I've seen. I've seen the uh, inefficient turn efficient when mobbing started. And uh, it, it's, you know, everything you've said has kind of resonated with me because it's it's very true. It, you know, we, we had, you know, multiple projects work, worked on by multiple people with handoffs in between. As soon as we started mobbing, it, uh, it became single item flow and something that used to take weeks to months to deliver started taking less than a day. And so, um, you know, I, I can uh, I can attest to that. It's uh, it, I've seen it firsthand, so it's pretty cool. Um, yeah, I think I think we're fortunate that uh, so you, both of you are experiencing something that uh, my experience is lower in, which is uh, talking to higher levels of organizational management about this uh, seemingly walking contradiction of efficiency of mobbing or swarming, right? And so. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess one follow-up question for you, Steve and Chris, because you both have been been through this uh, these dialogues several times, uh, is how do you how do you, you know? Let's say you're going to do that experiment. How do you make the cues visible, the waiting visible, in a way that they understand and that has worked well for you in the past with uh, persuading? Yeah. Great. Well, typically, I do not. <clears throat> I do not start with uh, with cues. Um, I start with something which is uh, much more tangible and that they can relate to, because managers want always to know, you know when when is this done? Why does it take so long? Um, so the first question is, well, how long does it really take? So can you do you have at least raw data to establish uh, uh, now how long work has taken. Do you know that? Often they don't. So uh, the first step is to um, to start measuring that because often you have all these wonderful backlogs that uh, where items are parked uh, for half of forever. So uh, they are they are there. Someone has had a thought which was stopped and uh, and that uh, and that initial embryonic thought of. Uh, uh, um, developing something or a requirement or an idea uh, is, is standing still in its track and uh, and you don't you're not concerned about it moving forward until the engineering team is actually starting to uh, to work on it and then of course it's the engineering team's fault that things are not fast enough and and, and efficient enough and and if you look at from that perspective, you see, you will see that uh, typically um, the the effective work is maybe between three and seven percent of the total time. So why are you focusing on trying to improve uh, 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 a thing that maybe is three seven percent when you have the the uh, remaining ninety plus percent where you could intervene and you're doing nothing? Um, so the first thing is start measuring uh, how long things take and just plot a flow distribution chart. So very, very simple. And, um, and the improvement process I use there is, uh, is looking at the aging of, of work items and with respect to the measured distribution, um, have signals, aging signals, so that when, uh, when a new work item is standing in, uh, in line or is in, in process for longer than, uh, than the average, then, uh, then uh, you might uh, uh, you might intervene. So these are like the I call them the work execution signals, and um, and those are really important because you are starting to uh, rewire the the in, the uh, 
let's say the neural network uh, inside the company, the companies can start to react react to these aging signals and do that frequently enough, and you will have uh, uh, um, you will start to see these times coming down. Then uh, when uh, and this is really really easy to do, so uh, so it does not require a lot of effort. But then when uh, when uh, the first positive results have come in, then uh, I start to actually you know highlight the cues and the active and and the wait states and uh, and start to arrive at more sophisticated um, methods. But on top of that, what really matters is that the managers must relate this to the, the economics. And, uh, and there I refer a lot to um, throughput accounting uh, techniques, which come directly from the theory of constraints. So at a certain point, you will always ask this question of what what jobs are you releasing onto the system? And by the way, have you been thinking of what is the value, what is the outcome of what you, you are putting in there? So uh, there you start approaching other aspects which are tied to the overall uh, results, but which maybe are more in the domain of how do managers at various levels and in various departments um, negotiate in between themselves what should go and what should not go into the uh, into the product development stream. Uh, so I try to move the focus away from from engineering proper and look at the wider picture of all the systemic elements that at the end produce this results and which apparently is always the fault of uh, uh, engineering that cannot keep up with uh, with the pace, but it must originate from somewhere. So that is an interesting question. Where does this come from? It's not like we go out of our way to hire bad people, right? <laughs> so it's, you know, we hire all these really smart people and then we put them in an inefficient system and then blame them for, uh, you know, for, for not being efficient. And so uh, sometimes, yeah, it just takes a little bit of reflection of, of what's going on. So I couldn't agree more. It's, it's, uh, it, it's just beginning to surface the things that are, that are obviously wrong with the system and, and get people to pay attention to that stuff. I find that sometimes the vocabulary is very like hard to throw around. And so I find myself, um, you know, looking for a lot of really strong analogies and, and comparisons to make. Um, and then, and then kind of slowly educating in that area in order to, uh, bring it to a, a point where people are understanding lean vocabulary and, and uh, constraint problem vocabulary. Um, and, and, but it, it's, it's nice to be hearing a, a very succinct and accurate description of what that might be. Um, I just had a little accident, but no problems. I'm still alive. <laughs> it's okay. Very good. Very good. Um, so I, I have maybe one anecdotal question following up to those two things is, um, this is going back a while in my career, but we are at a point where like, hey, we want to get better. We know things are not great. Um, and we have like an intuitive feel that are, we didn't use the word throughput at the time, but that's basically what we're uh, reaching at was our throughput's not great. Our efficiency is not great. We want to improve. And I think I forgot what it came down to in that moment was, hey, do we start measuring first before we change anything or do we just start changing stuff? And I think the quorum at the time was like, let's just start changing stuff and start trying to improve. Um, and then after a while, it became hard to know, like it feels better, but you know, we weren't measuring throughput or any of those kind of things first. Um, do you have, have you ever ran into that where other people just want to start improving without baseline measurements of some kind, or like lean type measurements? And uh, how have you helped them through that? <laughs> well, I think it's very, very common because uh, <clears throat> um, no one typically has the, the big picture uh, view, but they are unhappy of, uh, of, the, of the current state. So I'm not speaking about you no know, big, large scale uh, agile transformations, but even at the, uh, at the, at the team level, um, 
just you know one example someone might want to try pair programming but um, behold maybe no one has ever done that so why don't we just try it well that's that's uh, certainly a positive dynamic and uh, i also employ a lot um, in these instances uh, both with and without the metrics and the systemic view the um, I don't know if you've heard it before, the popcorn flow um, approach um, by Claudio Perone is an Italian living in, in Ireland. And it's, a, it's a really like a systematic way to um, facilitate validated learning through experimentation uh, in uh, uh, both small and, 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 large, uh, and large settings. And often uh, it is... Uh, a very good way to proceed. You know, if people uh, do a change and they feel better, uh, well, that has a huge um, significance in its own right. And you know, when people are happier, the performance always improves. So even if you might not have been measuring performance properly, uh, but people are happier, most likely performance is better as well. So I, I actively encourage all sorts of experimentation but I would then also suggest you not know, do it in some kind of structured form like the popcorn flow um, approach suggests, because then you can become much more systematic. You're, you're not going like blindfold. You're still following some sort of, uh, of logic, even if you are very, you have plenty of degrees of freedom to, to experiment with many different, different things. And of course, at times, this is really the best way to start. And at a, at a certain point, you might say, hey, why don't we run one experiment? Let's try to measure a few things. So you sneak in, so to say, the, the metrics element as part of this uh, experimentation. Because there is also this other very, um, how can we say, uh, difficult element that metrics uh, are very often abused or misused. And, uh, and people might have been exposed to abuse and misuse of metrics. So anytime they hear the word uh, metrics or numbers or measurements, they, um, they are very concerned. They, uh, they fear that they uh, will have another whip hitting them uh, on their backs. And uh, it is a valid concern, of course, because metrics have been used for this purposes in many different places. But then we must also understand that there are metrics which, uh, which can bring all people together. And that's where we get into like the, the unity of purpose uh, elements that, uh, that I so strongly you know, propose. But metrics are one element to arriving at that. That might be a good segue uh, yeah. <laughs> to, uh, to kind of skip to that topic. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about like, what is unity of purpose and and how uh, how it applies here? I think you're just talking a little bit about it, but maybe you can go a little bit deeper on that. So uh, my work is um, uh, profoundly based on on patterns and particular organizational patterns, and unity of purpose and community of trust, uh, they were first like described by Jim Coplin in one of his first books on, on uh, organizational uh, design patterns. Um, and I am strongly convinced that it's a key element in any high performing uh, organization. Uh, the simple reasoning is that, well, you know, if I and you, Chris, are in different uh, departments and, uh, and we are having conflicts, and it's very common because we are fed by different budgets. So, you know, my budget has to be larger than yours. And then we have all these dynamics of you know, the budgeting process and I, I need to get a larger slice of the cake and so on and so forth. Um, and on top of that, since we, we are in, uh, in different uh, uh, business units or teams, my KPIs will be different from yours, maybe totally unrelated to yours, maybe even inversely correlated to yours. So if I act to improve my KPIs to get my bonuses, uh, your KPIs will uh, instead go, uh, go down. Uh, one classical example is uh, you know, productivity of development versus productivity of testing. Um, 
the, uh, the the classical story. You know, the more failing case you find as a tester, the better you are as a tester, and uh, and uh, conversely, you have more work going back to development, and and uh, and and the developers take the short stick in that case. You no, know, another reason to focus on on mobbing and get get the whole thing done in in one go. But in that instance, we were saying, you know, we are in different departments and have different drivers. Um, well, what if those drivers were one for all, one and the same for all? Then we would have no reason to uh, to do all this uh, infights, but we could focus all of that energy on actually producing good stuff for the clients and uh, and maybe competing more with uh, with the market competitors rather than these artificial internal competitors. And the unifying element there, believe it or not, is throughput accounting. Because with throughput accounting, you can relate to what matters for the uh, C-level executives, which, uh, which is the financial performance. And uh, you can uh, relate that to the throughput of every bit and element of the value stream or value network that the company um, is structured in. And uh, throughput accounting is... Uh, is uh, uh, like pivoted around the constraint. So we go back to, to TOC, theory of constraints. If you're able to find the constraint and apply uh, throughput accounting, well, you are in a situation where all and every uh, organizational unit or department can work together because they understand they have all to help that single weak spot, which is the constraint, and thus the the conflicts like crumble away, and uh, and we have created unity because of this metrics. And of course, once you have the unity of purpose, many other things come so much simpler. Mm -hmm. I think um, one of the the key things, uh, you know, I, I came from organizations with di different bonus structures, and I've seen. I've seen the disincentive or the uh, the converse incentivization, right? And I've also seen the unified incentivization. And um, and two bonus structures that I've been a part of. One was, uh, you know, the productivity of your team versus the productivity of your of the other team. You you could you know suck up the entire bonus, right? Um, where uh, you know the place where mobbing started, it it was the entire company has the same bonus based on the performance of the company overall. And so like, this is like maybe on, on the broadest level, um, the, the bonus structure uh, at this other place was, was causing crazy amounts of infighting. And, and, you know, I think one of the contributors to, to working in a mob is that people were willing to ask for help because that, that wouldn't take away from other people's KPIs or their own, um, they, they had this unifying uh, purpose. So yeah, it was, uh, it, it, it's kind of like a, a very on, on the topic for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I think something that jumps out to me is um, there are often invisible uh, KPIs as well, like ones that aren't being reported on or measured or uh, reported up the chain. Cause I remember uh, uh, I was at a, I was at a place where improvement ideas were brought up. And um, at the time, there was no individual metric or team metric, but they were turned down, not because they weren't worthwhile. Um, They're like, yeah, that'll probably reduce our bugs and, you know, help us deliver more often. But I, that will make my team look bad or make me look bad, you know, or something like that. Um, do you, so is there anything you've seen to help that kind of more untangible, unmeasured uh, constraints that are out there that people that are feeding into people's behaviors, so to speak? Um, yeah, I mean, w would your solution help with that? I, I suppose, I, I guess I'm just envisioning like, hey, everyone, here's our constraint, here's our throughput, and this is all that matters. So I guess it takes more than just putting it out there it's like you need to coach it so to speak i would guess um i don't know what's your yeah. experience so, yeah. but that's a you know, very very um relevant point and uh the uh my my approach you know tame flow uh, is is about 
the taming of four flows. The one we've been talking about, well, the two we've been talking about are the operational flow and the financial flow. So the flow of work through the organization and uh, the, uh, the flow of, of cash. You now, how does the organization uh, get cash from, from the market? Um, but the other two flows, uh, one is the flow of information and the other one is a psychological flow. So here we are maybe going more into the realm of psychological flow and uh, and there uh, a lot um, a lot relates to um, I actually wrote about this in, uh, in my last newsletter this Monday uh, a lot relates to to storytelling and narratives what is the the kind of backdrop uh, um, stories we want to have that people can relate to and for instance um, I'm sure you know uh, with uh, theory of constraints the uh, uh, the the, uh, the initial uh, moment when the protagonist uh, Alex Rogo um, got the idea of the constraint it was the story of the Boy Scouts hiking through uh, through the wood and there was this uh, uh, little uh, let's say overweight uh, kid uh, who was also overloaded with his backpack and um, the team lead. Um, well, resolve the situation by reasoning around around this uh, weak uh, weak link in this chain. Now, when you recount that story, it's it's all focusing on on the on the physical element. Now, who, who is the weakest, and what can we do to increase the the speed of the entire team? Um, which is what uh, what the top managers want to hear. But there is another interpretation around this story, and that is, well, you know, we we leave no one alone behind in the woods, and uh, we always help the weakest person to manage that difficult situation. So when you start telling these stories from this perspective, and you actively encourage people to uh, to help one another and gain the understanding that you know what there will always be a weakest link. No matter what we do, someone of us will always be the weakest link. Maybe tomorrow you have an accident and, uh, and all of a sudden you become the weakest link. So we must always be prepared to help one another. And if someone has a problem, there is like no uh, dishonor in being the weakest link. So it's perfectly acceptable to ask for help. So these kinds of elements you you uh, uh, tackle with uh, with uh, working with the you know perception of people of um, even their identity because when you start um, nurturing these um, uh, feelings of being all in it uh, together the the sense of belonging you know, and okay I'm part of a team and the team is here to help me becomes much much stronger. Of course, it does not happen overnight, but if at the same time we go back to like the physical dimension, the performance dimension, at the same time, we have these metrics where we can actually show where things need to focus on, well, then, uh, then uh, even the management dynamics becomes different because managers might be used to try to uh, push uh, the uh, the teams uh, to improve the performance, but with this narrative, they will see, oh, where is the weakest team? How can I help the weakest team? So it becomes a mind shift even from the management management perspective, which um, uh, kicks off like um, virtuous um, loops, virtuous cycles, so to say. Yeah, definitely, and I think one thing that jumps out to me about that is um, kind of taming or coaching that narrative for the psychological aspect. But also I've noticed that the act of uh, doing collaborative things like pairing or mobbing, it naturally builds that kind of psychological flow of, hey, we're in this together and it's we're here to help each other, right? And the, I, like you said, you're speaking to an identity, right? When I go to my cubicle and work alone most of the time, I start to pride myself in what I'm bringing, right? And but the act of mobbing or the act of pairing where you get something done together that starts to fade away and the act of helping each other to get that thing done 
becomes the the primary thing. And so I think, um, yeah, I think I've seen that. And then and then you add into it, um, you know, team switching, right? Um, where it's like, hey, I was on this team six months ago or a year ago, and it's not like our team versus them. It's like I knew what it was like to be on that team, and you know, I kind of think it can help. I think those kind of things can help uh, form the unity of purpose, I believe, um, in a psychological way. Yeah. Yeah. The um, well, you just mentioned like the working together, the doing together. So you know, the act of co-creation is extremely powerful. I know I can tell you one uh, one of my uh, greatest success stories. Now this was was a long time ago, like 14 years ago. Um, when I was still very active in that uh, merger and acquisition space, so there was this multinational um, that um, uh, was actually a publisher, and they decided to to move uh, onto software because, you know, 2000, early 2000s, uh, every industry was was discovering the the, uh, the importance of software. So. Um, so they were uh, were publishing in uh, in uh, like the um, uh, compliance, health sector, legal, um, regulated industries, basically. So they decided to buy software companies, and they had lots of cash. So at the end, they had acquired like I think it was thirty more than thirty thirty two uh, acquisitions. This was in Europe, and uh, and then consolidated some. So at a certain point, they had like twenty three, twenty four different business units, typically one per country. Um, but um, the, uh, the point there was that they, they had done these acquisitions uh, without any consideration to the underlying technologies. So I, I, I um, remember telling the uh, chief operating officer, well, you, you are like uh, someone who's been very successful at some sports, uh, let's, uh, let's say, um, canoeing and all of a discover you just all of a sudden you discover that there is this beautiful thing which is called a ball software and you decided to buy lots of of uh, of ball teams so you bought a football team a golf player a tennis player a volleyball basketball you name them and now you want them all to play the same game so it doesn't matter that they have the commonality of of developing software they are so diverse we had people programming in PL1, now imagine that, uh, almost a forgotten language, COBOL, uh, to the latest, uh, very first instances of, uh, of, C, uh, um, of C Sharp. I think these were the first years when, when Max was releasing C Sharp. Uh, and, and anything in between. There were like uh, two, two uh, some teams were like two or three guys in a garage, literally, and others were like, like uh, 60 people in engineering uh, with uh, with uh, CMMI level five maturity, and uh, so a oh, great great mix. Now, of course, when they do these acquisitions, what do they want to do? They want to consolidate. Why? Because they want to do cost savings. It's the cost accounting world. So they uh, did engage uh, one of the major uh, um, consultancy companies. And they did two projects for two years, uh, one year each. So twice they tried to do this consolidation. But what was the problem? That every country manager, every um, engineering head, they, uh, they were protective, of course, of what they had done. They had put a career in developing those companies and those products. So they feared that uh, they would be put aside. And uh, basically all these people, like um, um, 20, 20 country managers, they were all uh, fighting one another and sabotaging all these attempts at, uh, at consolidation. So the projects never took off. Then I was called in and um, um, at that time I was doing also CMMI assessments, believe that or not. Um, which, by the way, you know, CMMI as a concept is good. It's telling you uh, the the what needs to be done, not the how. So, but then in reality, it's being taken as a recipe. So now that's another story. But anyway, I uh, I uh, was doing this for uh, for over a, uh, almost a year, and I was seeing that 
um, this is not going to work. These people just don't want it. So how can we resolve that? Um, and uh, there was like this final uh, meeting where um, even my uh, attempt was going to be declared as a failure. And I, uh, and like out of uh, last resort, I, I suggested to uh, to the COO, well, no, let me run another uh, two or three workshops. It won't take more than a month. And, uh, and uh, I, I bet that I can resolve this. And, and they were so desperate now after basically three years with no result, they said, okay, you know, what's, what's one month more? We've, we've tried everything, you know, the, the boat is almost sinking. So let's try this one as well. So what I did there was that I, I uh, introduced agile concepts to, uh, um, to these uh, representatives of these business units. They were both uh, um, the country managers, the, uh, let's say the product owners, product managers, the chief of engineering. Uh, so the, the assembly of people was quite substantial. We had to, to, uh, to use a hall in a, in a large hotel. And um, I gave them one first assignment because, you know, everyone was pulling my sleeves. They said, no, oh, yeah. they, they thought I was going to make a choice. So they thought that I was going to pick one existing solution over the other. So everyone was there pulling my sleeve and saying, no, pick mine, take mine. It's, it's the best. We'll, uh, we'll make it work for everyone. But anyway, I said, no, we won't pick anything. But now you go home. You go home. And for the next week, you know what? I taught you about user stories. Start just writing user stories uh, of uh, describing what you have and how you want that thing to evolve. And of course, everyone thought that that exercise was going to be judged by like a beauty contest so that I would be picking the winner. So they put the most effort they could to, to make their collection of user stories be the best. And then we came to like two weeks later to the, uh, the topical moment. And they all came with their piles of user stories, very protective and secretive. They didn't want to reveal their cards, literally. Um, and uh, the first thing I told them shocked them. So now take all these cards, put them there in the middle of the, the large table in this hall and mix them up completely. So they paled away. Uh, I, they did that. And uh, then I said, now we're going to pair. Uh, get your laptops. Um, and uh, one uh, of you goes and pick a story. And another one will stand, uh, will be at the keyboard. So this was like pair programming. But it was not like the, the, the driver and the navigator. It was more like the scribe and the narrator. And I gave them another twist. Um, uh, so they kept on pairing until all of them were busy. And I told them, you have just 15 minutes. And the narrator is going to tell how that story that you picked is good or bad and evolve it and describe it to the scribe. And the scribe will transcribe the, the interpretation. And once that was, was done, the roles flipped. So the uh, the narrator became the scribe, and the scribe went and paired with someone else. So I call this like, um, uh, it was like promiscuous pairing, but it was about story authoring. It was not about coding. So promiscuous uh, pair story, uh, story authoring. Um, and these pairs switched over every 15 minutes until the story like became stable. So they... Uh, they uh, converged and maybe someone got onto, onto uh, uh, a new story and said, oh, but this is similar to the one that I wrote. So one story less because uh, they consolidated what, uh, what had uh, uh, emerged from that conversation. And then, of course, others maybe had new ideas together, so, but then we could do this. So together, the two that maybe were from different countries and different teams, they added new things to those stories. So in, um, in, uh, in one week, then this exercise went, went on eight hours a day with, with these, um, well, the, the size of the team at that point was 
uh, I think 30 because they sent only the, the product owners and the, the head of engineers um, of engineering. So after one week, all of them had worked on all stories together and uh, the, the set had like consolidated from, uh, I don't remember how many there were, but at the end they were like 200 stories. And then we did one last exercise, but that's like uh, already beyond the effect. At that point, they had everything in mind, uh, resolved. Uh, the last exercise was doing like an economic valuation of that. So we called the, the CFO from, uh, uh, from Amsterdam and, uh, and uh, explained what we were doing. There was an economic evaluation for every single user story and then ranking and, and triaging and lots of stories got discarded because of an economic evaluation. So it was the first time that an economic perspective came into the actual, uh, let's say, uh, up, uh, upfront activity of deciding, uh, well, upfront activity is not the right word, but I mean, the discovery activity, the, the divergence activity of, of collecting ideas. Um, so uh, the first time that an economic element came into that, that phase so early, and then uh, with that additional filter of the 200 stories went down to maybe uh, I think 120. And then we got to the uh, key moment. I, uh, I asked every one of them, uh, are you ready to support this project? If you are, come here and sign this paper. They did so. And that became like the unanimous decision that all of them subscribed to start to kick off this new project. Why? Because they had experience co-creation. Mm. That was the power of co-creation. All those conflicts that had been dragging for three years with sabotage or pulling of sleeves and who knows what other maneuvers they had tried with the other consultants, uh, they just evaporated because they spent one intense week pairing one with the other all the time, every 15 minutes, flipping, flipping, switching. And uh, no, it's uh, just an amazing uh, experience. And that was like the moment that this uh, huge conglomerate finally consolidated all these uh, um, software engineering efforts. It was also the project that came out of that was also the very first software as a service project uh, offering that they had. So it like set the stage for, for the uh, subsequent development. And as of today, they are still using that uh, uh, well, the outcome of that of that exercise. How fantastic! What a cool story! Thank you so much for sharing. Yeah, I think uh, the power of co-creation is is very strong, and um, I think we we are coming up on time though. But this has been really really fascinating, Steve. Thank you so much. Uh, is there anything you'd like to plug or share before we close the show? Well, uh, of course, I would invite uh, all uh, listeners to uh, to check up Tameflow. But in particular, you know, if they want to, to see the most advanced applications of Tameflow, uh, get my last uh, latest book, uh, Tame Your Workflow. You'll find everything on tameflow.com. There is a page about books, and uh, you will uh, you will find a special offer there. Um, I should maybe add that that book in particular does not highlight uh, any, any mobbing or uh, uh, swarming or pair programming because it's... Uh, it's more for uh, managing uh, very uh, uh, large organizations that have multiple projects, product streams, many stakeholders, uh, many events and deadlines and teams. I call them the pest environment. Um, and just to give you a perspective, you know, this has been used in situations where the engineering team was like 4,000 people across um, uh, 120 teams uh, spread globally, and they had uh, a load of, on average, 70,000 change requests per month. So that's that's where you need some serious metrics and some serious like engineering of the of the whole uh, uh, development process. Um, but uh, even if that is like the ultimate uh, um, case and and uh, the, the the proof of the pudding, so to say. The ideas that I present there, I think, are valuable for any situation where you have more than one team working together. So invite everyone to take a look at Tame Your Workflow. 
Fantastic. Excellent. Uh, well, uh, please like and subscribe. And uh, if, if you find this uh, information valuable and would like to share it with others, please do so. Um, and please give us feedback. Uh, uh, the things uh, Steve mentioned, we'll be sure to put in the show notes. And uh, mob well. Have a good one and uh, uh, tame your flows. So see you later. Bye, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Bye.